folk. So my section talking about the tax perspective of IR35, and I think probably, although I would imagine a lot of people, if you've joined the call, you're aware of what IR35 is. I think it's probably useful just to give a wee bit of context around it. So, so that everybody talks about IR35, but the official name is actually the off-payroll working rules. Um, but I think you'll all agree that that's a little clumsy. So I think typically and throughout the session, we'll refer to IR35, I think. It really applies to workers who are providing their services through their own limited company. Now, when I say limited company, it can extend to other types of intermediaries is the term that's used in the legislation. But for all practical purposes, the, the, the vast majority of situations we're going to see is where the, the, the individuals providing services through their own limited company, which is for shorthand known as a personal services company or PSC. And I guess the question that the IR35 rules ask is, if you took the company out of the equation and you looked at the services and the way the, the, the individual provides their services to their end client, would you look at it and say, well, it looks like and kind of smells like an employee type relationship? You know, so if you answer yes to that question, if you took the company out and the individual looks like an employee of the client, then the IR35 rules are going to apply in that situation. So why is it changing then? So I think it's fair to say, first of all, that the IR35 rules have been around for, for a great number of, of years. Um, but the, the big change that we'll talk about is that historically, the onus was on the personal services company itself to decide whether the rules actually applied or not. So it wasn't actually, um, you know, it was kind of almost a self-assessment system in truth. And uh, the reality of the situation, probably that only a small proportion actually did ultimately look at it and decide that the rules applied. Anybody who did consider it um, did actually ultimately, you know, decide that, that the rules didn't apply. But the reality is a lot of PSEs really just just ignored it. So in 2017, the government t t put their toe in the water in terms of changing the rules by, by rolling these new rules out to the, uh, to the public sector, first of all. So engagements within the, between public sector organizations and people with their own PSCs were brought into a new rules where essentially the, the onus was placed on the public sector body to determine the status in the arrangement rather than the PSC. So kind of it was putting the onus on the public sector organization to decide whether that employment like relationship did exist. If they decided that it did, then essentially there was an obligation on them to operate pay as you earn on the payments that were made um, to the uh, to the personal services company in that situation. And so the real reason why this is changing, let me be brutally honest, is they tried it with the private sector. It raised something like £550 million. Pounds, so they decided, actually, do you know what? That's not a bad idea. Let's roll it out to the private sector as well. Forgive me if I sound a little cynical about some of this. Um, so what are the key changes then around IR35? So from April 2021, the onus is going to be on large and medium-sized clients to determine the status of their off-payroll workers, so their workers providing their services through PSCs and determining whether that employment-like relationship exists in that situation. Now, it's, you know, it's very clear that the rules apply to large and medium sized clients. So, so what, what does that mean? Where, where do we draw the line? So if you're a small client, the new rules don't apply to you. And when I say clients, it's the end user of the, the, the PSC services, if you like. So if you've got, if you're a, if you're a, a company or an LLP, then the rules essentially say, to be a small client, you've got to have two out of the three of the following. So you've got to either have a turnover of less than 10.2 million, gross assets of less than 5.1 or less than 50 employees. So if you take two of those boxes as a company or an LLP, you're, you're, a, small, you're a small client and, and essentially the rules revert back to what the old rules were, which was it's the kind of the PSC that has to make the decision about whether, um, whether, the, new, whether the rules apply. Um, they've introduced this, what they call a simplified test for other partnerships, i.e. non-LLP partnerships and sole traders, where really if your turnover is below 10.2 million, again, as a client rather than as a PSC, then the, re the new rules don't apply to you. Um, if the new rules apply, then the body that's paying the PSC will have to withhold pay as you earn and pay national insurance contributions on the payments to the PSC. Now, in most, you know, in a lot of cases, there's going to be a direct engagement 
Um, but essentially, you, you can find a situation, obviously, where there might be a supply chain where the client actually engages with an agency, which then provides the services of the peer of the uh, of the worker through their own PSC. And really, what we're looking at here, although the rules are slightly more complicated than this, fundamentally, you're looking who's the one who's ultimately paying the personal services company, uh, who's the one that actually is 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 making that payment. And if that once you've got to that, once you've determined that, then they're the ones that have the obligation to operate, pay as you earn, and so forth. Um, and essentially, worst case scenario, if there's non-compliance, in other words, if you either ignore the rules or you don't implement the rules properly, then the pay as you earn and NIC liabilities can be passed on either to the client in the work, you know, if the client doesn't fulfil its obligations, or if the pay is an agency. And they don't fulfill their obligations, then the, the pay as you earn an NIC liability can pass on to the agency instead. So we talk about this employment-like relationship. So what, what does that actually mean? What are the factors that we need to consider when we're looking at whether an employment-like relationship actually exists? Um, the reality is this is not new. This is something that's always applied to individual contractors, and it still applies to individual contractors who don't have their own PSCs. But essentially, there's, there's, there's kind of a series of tests that you have to look at, the first of which is control. To what extent does the client, the user of those services, actually control when, where, how those services are delivered? The more the degree of control, the more it kind of looks and feels like an employment relationship. Whereas if it's the, the worker that kind of says, well, you know, I've got to do this job, but it's up to me when, where and how I do it, then that kind of makes it feel more like a genuine third party contractor relationship. Substitution is a big one. And I think John touches on, uh, you know, we'll, we'll potentially touch on, on some of this stuff again. Um, substitution says, well, if I'm the worker and I can't turn up, can I just send somebody else to do the job for me without necessarily the client actually being able to, to have any say in that? If you can, you know, as a normal employee, you wouldn't be able to do that. I, you know, Alice couldn't say to, to WR partners, you know, I'm going to send my friend to do my job today. But if you're a, if you're a genuine contractor relationship, the client really is only interested in getting the job done. They don't care who it's done by. So if you can make that substitution, it starts to look like a non-employment relationship. Um, the next test is financial risk, which is really looking at, you know, are we, you know, is the, is the contractor, is the worker actually bearing any financial risk? And that can be as simple as they having to provide their own insurance. If something goes wrong, is it at their cost? It has to be fixed. Again, the more financial risk, the more it looks like a genuine relationship, the less the IR35 rules are likely to apply. And the final one is, is kind of integration. Um, you know, to what extent is the individual integrated into the, into the client organization? So if they've got an email address with the client, if they appear on the website as part of the team, you know, if they're subject to the kind of performance management system within the client, it makes it look more like an employment-like relationship, in which case the individual, you know, will potentially fall within, or the, the relationship will potentially fall within IR35. There's no silver bullet, there's no right or wrong answer. It is a case of weighing up all of the factors and reaching what's a reasonable conclusion. Now, HMRC kindly provide their CES tool, Check Employment Status for TAC, which, tax, which is online, and the, and the link is, is there um, for you to use in due course. And that is a tool where it asks you a series of questions and it spits out a determination at the end. And what HMRC have said is if you answer the questions accurately and it says that the relationship is not employment-like, they will respect that. Um, the reality, though, is the tool is a pretty blunt instrument. It throws out too many unstatus, you know, uncertain status returns. And I think probably the other, the other point there for a, a, an old cynic like me is, you know, if you're HMRC and you're going to build a tool, you're going to, you're going to be inclined to weight it more towards the answer that gives you the, the result that you're looking for. Now, I wouldn't suggest, of course, that they do that consciously, but maybe, you know, there is an element of that in there but nevertheless it is a useful tool and if you answer the questions honestly and it says it's not an employment like relationship hmrc will respect that outcome so in terms of what the process is um, essentially uh, this nice flow chart that we've got here says the client business the end user of the services makes a determination based on the factors that we've just talked about and they have to take reasonable care they can't just have a stab in the dark they've got to make a reasonable effort 
having made having determined the status of the worker they have to issue the PSC and potentially other you know mem other parts of the supply chain if there is one with a status determination statement which says we've concluded that either the IR 35 rules do or don't apply and gives uh, gives reasons um, so once the PSC has ultimately received that status determination, then they've got the right to object within 45 days of the day that they, uh, that they receive it. Um, and they can give their reasons why they think the, 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 the determination is wrong. Um, the appeals process, however, is back to the organization that made the determination in the first place, the client. So one would hope that the client would be sufficiently open-minded open and actually if there's other information, they would form a view. But it is essentially the, the client is, is not only the, the one who makes the determination, but they're also the one who decides whether the determination is right in the, in the event of um, in the event that the, the PSC uh, objects. Um, once that determination has been decided, then there's effectively no right of appeal uh, beyond that point. 